welcome to Knights of Roleplay, an adventuring podcast. This is an actual play 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons podcast. Royalty free music provided by Kevin MacLeod, Plate Mail Games, and Tabletop Audio. And now, to adventure. Hello and welcome. My name is Chris Buckner. I'm the primary dungeon master for Knights of Roleplay and Adventuring Podcast. And this episode is a special cross promotion with our friends uh, at Old Men Rolling Dice. They have their own live play um, Dungeons and Dragons podcast. Although they've they've switched format a little bit since COVID, but we'll we'll go into that a little more later. And, and we're primarily going to talk about some of our favorite uh, campaign settings. And since we're all of the the middle age group we're going to be talking probably mostly about second edition kind of stuff uh stuff from the 80s so um we'll just get right into the discussion right now so if you guys um we have jeremy and jason from all men rolling dice if you guys just want to talk a little bit about your podcast i did listen to uh the episode about the the 80s movies which i thought was great <laughs> and i listened to one of your live plays which i have some questions about but um if, <laughs> If you if you just want to talk a little bit about your podcast so that so that our listeners with Knights of Roleplay can be familiar with you guys, then you know, feel sure. free. Jay, do you want to take it? No, you always started rolling, and I'll jump in. I'll interrupt when I see it's appropriate. <laughs> yeah, you interrupt me. You interrupt me. So, uh, yeah, so we're old men rolling dice. Uh, we started out as a live play podcast. That was certainly the plan. Uh, we started by playing Princes uh, of the Apocalypse. Nice. And uh, we jammed that into a homebrew setting as opposed to the Forgotten Realms or something like that, just to have a little bit more freedom with it. And we did that for our first, I would say our first year. There's probably, there's probably about 12, 12 or 13 episodes published. And there's probably another t- half, maybe six or seven episodes sitting on my hard drive um <laughs> that uh, i just got we really got tired of editing those up we we were not <laughs> recording them properly we had we had the wrong equipment and there was a lot of editing going into it and it was taking a lot of time and then then covid came along like you said yeah. and uh we did not meet for live plays anymore and we switched uh our live play stuff over to twitch and started streaming and jason and i started uh interviewing people yeah we had been interested in, i think maybe in covering a couple of different topics that weren't directly related to live play and it was like well we mm-hmm. we're already here and we're already working in the format and jeremy and i both work uh shift work so occasionally we're around on a wednesday during the day and nobody else is here it was really easy suddenly just to pour a cup of coffee and, and touch on a topic that maybe we were both interested in and i think it's generally not coffee though <laughs> uh, I think it was coffee once. I, I think so. I think so. One cup of coffee. I think so. Uh, but not just that. I think it was one of those things where this has really been a great outlet, and I think I, we've talked about this a lot. I mean, the pandemic, twenty twenty, even rolling into twenty twenty one, has been a rough time for a lot of people. Yeah. And um, I know I've probably said this exact same point in, the, in a previous podcast. It's easy to get caught up in all this sort of negative stuff that's happened. And I think part of what we've been trying to do, especially lately, with is trying sort of like, you know what, there's a, there's got to be some silver linings out there. There has to be something that sort of gets you from A to B these days, something that gives you something to look forward to on the weekend. And so yeah. sort of trying to throw these topics out and maybe even we become really interested in sort of community building, like realizing that an online community, a gaming community, a community of friends, and even sort of the community you live in is something that maybe we're not contributing massively to it but it never hurts any little bit you can do to sort of build that up and uh and, and share you know kind of what you're doing with other people and hear about the things they're doing is something uh we're trying to sort of touch on these days yeah it's, it's awesome i've been seeing like a lot of the sort of community support stuff i've looked at other podcasts when i first wanted to get into this one i started listening to all these D podcasts uh, like dungeons and daddies and uh, adventure maidens and adventure zone and all these different things and uh, I was really excited about all of the um, the support from all the community, everybody trying to build up all these cool ideas. And I was learning all these things that I didn't really know and sharing the passion of the game with everyone, and not just D&D, but lots of other tabletop games too, both role-playing and otherwise. 
Um, so this is this is really this is fun. I like doing cross promotions. I did one with another podcast uh, very early on in our podcast history, and so then I saw you guys and I thought, I bet you these guys are right around my age, and we probably have a lot in common. So we should definitely cross promote. <laughs> yeah, old men rolling dice. The title kind of it sets. It, it paints a picture for people. I think uh, we we are the ad like we are the old men ro- literally rolling dice. Uh, from you know, I st- I got my start with Redbox and that's every awesome. ed- every edition since. Uh, Jason, I think did you start in did you start in advance AD and D? You start with AD. Really early 80s, 80, say 81, 82. I've been trying to track it down. My memory gets a little hazy sometimes. I didn't pay attention yeah. back then a lot. No, that's um, cool, though. You guys are a little 80, advanced for me. I, I started in 86. 86? Okay, no, I started in 84. I started in 84. Yep. Gotcha. I was te- I was 10 in 84 to, to broadcast my age. So Jason's just really old. Is what he saying. is. He is the old. <laughs> old uh, he is the old of old men rolling dice. <laughs> But I don't think, it, but I gained sort of hard then. And then I took a, a very long casual break. I'm you did. Recently sort of in the last couple years, gotten back into it. Because um, you didn't, you didn't play second, was, third or fourth, right? I think I played some 3.5 with you guys a little bit. Because I remember buying the books for it. Maybe. But it might have been with Marcus too. You might be um, right. I, I missed second entirely. I missed fourth entirely. You um, didn't miss much. <laughs> No, <laughs> that seems to be the general. Concern. Did you play fourth, Chris? Um, I did. I did. I mean, and I liked it at, at first, but then I grew to hate it very quickly. <laughs> you, know, you know what? You know, this is my this is my take on fourth edition. This is totally off topic for what we're going to talk about. That's but anyways, fine. It's fine. Fourth edition to me was a great option for someone that wanted to fantasy game. Sure. But if you had played Dungeons and Dragons before that, you clearly. Uh, could see that this was not your game anymore like it had changed significantly, <laughs> significantly yeah absolutely. yeah so it's so like i look back on fourth and i go geez you know that game had some good stuff like i love the i love the goon rules i love uh i still have players that'll say is it bloodied is the target bloodied we, we uh, use that term we use that do you? Term. yeah <laughs> yeah see? we do <laughs> so, i mean fourth 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 is like is is like the uh you know the the unwanted stepchild uh, of Dungeons the, and the Dragons. The red-headed stepchild. The red-headed stepchild. Yeah. I wasn't going to say it. I wasn't going to say it. Uh, <laughs> no, for the listeners. There, right? like, yeah, I, I have red hair for the listeners. <laughs> uh, in in, However, uh, Chris is the only one of the three of us that actually has hair on his head. Uh, <laughs> Thanks. So, so for that, I mean, who cares what color it is? You've got it. We do not. Um, but I think fourth, I think if you, I think if you had introduced fourth and called it something totally different, I think it might've found its niche. But because yeah. it was sort of advertising itself as I'm Dungeons and Dragons, people like just hated on it. Yeah, it, it played very, very differently. And and the one thing I did like about it was because they built it on a structure of like a video game, mm-hmm. um, it, it was it was extremely balanced because they just applied the same formula to every class. So everything was balanced. Everything did the same amount of damage at, at the same level. And I didn't really feel like anything was overpowered in that system. But like you said, it was just... It was so different from a tabletop role-playing game where you're doing a little more theater to the mind and it was more steeped in like, this is how you design a video game. And it was just very, very different. So so I remember taking turns where we would have a combat and it would be like 30 minutes between my turn and then my next turn. And I was tracking like 10 conditions. And that was one of the things that drove me nuts about it. And I started to be like, oh my God, this is just so far from d and I don't think I could do it anymore. <laughs> Did you play any Pathfinder? Uh, I didn't. I I understand that it was constructed basically from uh, th- people using 3.5 rules and then sort of having like a, a public playtest kind of a thing. And so they yeah. made their own system. And I yeah. thought that was a great idea. And I imagine Pathfinder is probably really awesome, but I just, I, I went from it, fourth it, to fifth. It, yeah. So, so I was playing 3.5 and then fourth edition rolls around and we start playing it and we got... A campaign going and we soon realized this is not our dungeons and dragons so i picked up i'd heard good things about pathfinder and i picked up pathfinder um and it was great introduced it we played pathfinder for a lot of years pathfinder is great at 10th level and lower (laughs) and when your party gets to about 10th level uh 
I've, I've heard it called math finder and I would uh. totally agree with that. The <laughs> number of modifications, this you're talking about like at, in fourth edition, having to stack all these conditions and stuff. Yeah. Pathfinder gets like in my last Pathfinder campaign, before we switched to fifth edition, we were literally running a spreadsheet at the table, <laughs> tracking buffs and debuffs uh, for everyone. Yeah. So Jason, you didn't, you didn't take part in any of that. I, you know what, once again, I don't pay attention at all. I'm positive I was involved in those games because I'm pretty sure I remember <laughs> complaining like, and they rolled a seven and 15 minutes later, he convinced me it was an 18. I don't know how, <laughs> but there was like, you know, well, I'm flanked and that's a, it's a favorite enemy. And then it just started rolling. Right. And you're like, <laughs> can we just roll one dice and just there's, back in the day. But there's two, people out there that like that kind of a game they do they are and fun. i thought i liked that kind of a game i was like yeah that's what i want all that crunch and then fifth edition comes out and i try fifth edition out and i feel like i'm back in second edition playing yeah. again and i have so much more freedom and so much ability to homebrew on yes. top of the fifth edition rules that i'm yes. just like well i'm home now because I, as much as i had a great time with pathfinder i don't want that crunchy stuff anymore i can i can do everything here and so much quicker exactly. so and i'm not saying fifth is perfect there's i have some issues with fifth edition but yeah it, it's still for me for it's still the best bang for the buck in my okay. opinion okay so, so that there's my rant <laughs> that's all good so so i'm curious about because i listened to a couple of your episodes i listened to the the 80s um t, um yes and, and there was another one i'm not sure if it was one of the prince of the apocalypse but there there was a session i was trying to figure out what was going on with you guys because it was a live play and it sounded like you had maybe like three players and they all had like three characters and like they were getting killed and you guys were like i only have this guy oh left. i bet so, you were listening to our dungeon crawl classic game dungeon yeah that, i think that's what it was can you explain um to the listeners what that is because so I'm, I, I'm confused by it. <laughs> so Dungeon Crawl know. Classics is sort of a throwback to original Dungeons & Dragons. Uh -huh. Even before Redbox, we're talking God. the white box that came out of Mr. Gygax's basement. <laughs> and uh, it, it goes back to that. And then it looks at... So we didn't really know what it was either. And there, there is an interview on, on our podcast library with uh, Judge Brian. Okay. Uh, and Judge Brian oh, is... A, a friend of a friend <laughs> who we were curious about this old school gaming because I mean we're old guys. Go ahead, Jay. Can you give me one? Okay, so it's by Goodman Games, and I was okay. after yes. we played it. It was on their website, and they were talking about how happy they were. They'd launched some products, and they're like, you know, we've been receiving reviews for years, and they're like, our favorite review of Dungeon Crawl Classics is still a review that is from the first year it was released. And they're like, we still release it in our press every once in a while. And I I have got a copy of that review. It is like only a couple lines long. So Dungeon Crawl Classics for the uninitiated is, this isn't your father's D&D. It's your batshit crazy uncle's D&D. Straight from the <laughs> smoky basement with faded black light posters on the walls and 80s man of war blaring on an old tape deck. You might turn up your nose at first, but once the seven-sided dice start rolling, you'll find yourself sucked in. So, so <laughs> it's like nice. That, and that is, is a great. That's a great example. <laughs> it is. It is a throwback, and it is trying to grab a piece of nostalgia. Um, you, I, I mean, you should Gonzo. probably, if you're going to play Dungeon Crawl Classics, you should probably have some heavy metal playing somewhere. Um, <laughs> I, I like metal. <laughs> and and uh, so what Maybe Dungeon Crawl Classics? What you were listening to it was a funnel, right? Yeah, it was a funnel like adventure. Something very specific to DCC is what um, everybody sits around the table and you spend a couple of minutes making these absolutely generic level zero characters, and it's okay. totally random. Okay, three D six and the order they yeah. fall. You don't have any like, control. Like you don't sit down and go, "I want to be a fighter." Gotcha. No, you just sit down and roll up uh, four <laughs> stat like, blocks. Okay, you are a halfling chicken butcher. You have a meat cleaver <laughs> and you have a chicken. Gotcha. There's something in a cave down the road. You are in a party with a turnip farmer who has a pitchfork. They're like, it's, and then like, whoever <laughs> survives suddenly becomes first level characters. And are, are in Dungeon Crawl Classics, uh, it's called a judge, not a dungeon master. Uh, and the judge uh, 
sort of uh, our judge Brian has like great experience with the game and how he explained it to us was don't come to this don't come to the table with a backstory this funnel adventure where you play four zero level characters each is your backstory uh and don't come to the table assuming that your characters know like oh we know of the city of water deep over there and never winter (laughs) in the north he's like the your four characters have probably only been over the next hill sort of like the Samwise Gamgee line from Lord of the Rings where like he's standing on the on the edge of the farmer's field and he's like I've never been a foot further from the Shire than I am right now (laughs) that's what all your characters are so they don't know anything and that and then in our case in our um funnel there is this uh family this spooky old house uh the family of butchers and uh it was dark it got very dark very fast (laughs) so we played through a funnel it's all rolled and open like there's no dm screen or anything like well that's the way i think there is a dm screen but brian played it very uh, the dice just (laughs) fall where they fall it was and it was the uh, first time we played it was it was a heck so the idea of the funnel is that that story becomes your backstory and you probably don't leave the funnel with all your characters. So if you start the funnel with four characters, by the end of the funnel, um, if you only have one character left, that character becomes level one. And then your campaign continues from there. And they'll always remember the day they were with the, you know, the mob outside of... If you play higher levels Dungeon Crawl Classics, it's not very much more forgiving. Like every time you (laughs) cast a spell, you don't, uh, unlike Dungeons and Dragons, you don't run out of casts on your spells. You gotcha. keep rolling. As long as they're successful, you keep casting. But the moment it's unsuccessful, like you're cursed horribly. <laughs> Bad <laughs> things happen. <laughs> well, the whole thing, all the stuff you guys are, are, are describing sounds really interesting and cool. I'd never heard of anything like that. So that that's really awesome. Thank you for explaining it. <laughs> I think if you, I think anybody who likes D&D, if you get a chance to run a Dungeon Crawl Classics game, especially a zero level funnel, mm-hmm. Tons of fun. It I, might not be for everybody, but yeah. just to say you've done it and people start talking about old school gaming, <laughs> yeah. you can say, no, I, I know. At, at one point about. in that adventure, we open the attic door. We're climbing up in the attic. There's something up in the attic. And the DM rolls and my character disappears into the attic. They're dead. Just dead. <laughs> just dead. <laughs> yeah. The, 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 the damage was a one, like, there is no like negative 10 or there's no death saves if you hit zero hit points you're dead so boom i was up in the attic and whatever was up there got me and i was dead and it was that fast there was no like oh can we say no we can't save them Uh, that's cool that's awesome and uh, i'm curious um you said that when covid came out you guys stopped doing the live play Mm -hmm. now we we switched over to doing stuff on zoom and doing more theater of the mind although i tried using minis and a camera for a little while but that got a little bit clunky so i we just went pure theater of the mind um did you guys not want to go onto zoom when you guys when covid happened there was some discussion to do something like that yeah uh we just and i got very excited about streaming uh i've been asked by a couple people do you guys stream a game and so i really wanted to give it a shot uh but not everybody that played in our podcast wanted to be live on a camera yeah same thing with same thing with my group yeah so 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 you guys are doing live streaming now with your we're doing live streaming now but only myself and one two players myself and two players came with me gotcha and then we found two other players and uh and so we we now have a party of four so we and so we stream on sunday nights we're doing uh, ghost assault marsh and then we've started another stream on wednesday nights where we run ice Dale. okay do you want you want to give your 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 twitch channel oh sure twitch twitch twitch.tv slash dm underscore jeremy okay we did not go with old men rolling dice because at first i wasn't sure that it was an old men rolling dice project and then (laughs) it started rolling along well and i'm like well we're here now so we use it as our old men rolling dice stream but uh but it doesn't have the old men rolling dice tag. Okay, I, I was just curious. A lot of online games okay, I, just don't necessarily record and release a lot of it. Like we have a yeah. Thursday night game. Yeah, yeah. Um, sort of wizardry. Um, 
Yeah, I think everybody's gaming in a bunch of different formats and a lot of theater of the mind stuff, which is really awesome once you get rolling into it. <laughs> theater of the mind is far easier much on more this like format. old school gaming, right? You're yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's it's easier than what I tried to use the minis over Zoom and it was yeah. just a pain. Theater of the okay. mind is so much better. And I had to self teach myself roll twenty. It's not as easy as people make it sound. And then okay. This new group that I DM on Wednesday nights, they wanted to use fantasy grounds. So I had to teach <laughs> myself fantasy grounds as well. And like, it, these are not anybody who decides to, to play with those, you know, virtual, virtual tabletops, tabletops. Yeah. Bless them because uh, <laughs> it's not, it's not an easy thing to pick up, especially from the DM side of things. It, it takes a little bit of time and you need to have some patient players. And uh, fortunately I had that. And, you know, now I consider myself relatively proficient with D20. I'm still learning fantasy grounds, but. Uh, okay. I have some questions about your game though now too. Yeah, sure. Go for it. So you guys run Spelljammer Thank and you. we're going to talk, we're going to talk about some old settings tonight. Yeah. Spelljammer is like, <laughs> it's a favorite of mine, <laughs> but every time I say to someone, let's do a Spelljammer game, the eyes roll. Like they're there, you either love this setting or you don't love this setting. <laughs> so I want to who's like just neutral with it. Everybody has a very yeah. strong feeling about spell jammer. It elicits excitement from some people and and that fourth edition anger from some people. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny that it and it's been on the fringes for so long. Mm. And you kind of almost forget about it, and then every once in a while. I love the set. I love the setting. But what I want to know, Chris, is yeah. first of all, like when you sat down and went, we're gonna put together a game. And so what brought you back one to second edition uh to find Spelljammer? And then what is it about Spelljammer that like makes you go, This is what I need to run? Okay, so um I've been playing D D for 35 years about right now. And um, you know, I, I experience all the everything from advanced uh all the way through like i, play, I played advanced D and then advanced second edition and, and basically i started in advanced and you know so i saw dark sun ravenloft spelljammer you know all, all, all the settings um i one time or another and spelljammer was something that i don't think i ever actually played i'm trying to think i, I don't think i ever actually played spelljammer at any point but i always thought it was awesome and i think it was because like you said most people didn't most people that I knew didn't want to play it, but I did. So we just never did uh, as a group. And um, so I've been playing for all that time, mostly as a player. And then um, in 2015, I decided to run a game for my wife and some of our, some of our friends. And I was doing that with my other group where we'd been playing on Thursdays for like 12 years. And it was mostly the same group. And as my friend who had introduced D and D to me when I was a teenager, and when I started my own group, I did like two or three campaigns. One was set on Innistrad, which was the Magic the Gathering plane. And one was uh, Sword Coast. And then at one point I was getting toward the end of, I think it was the Innistrad game. And I said, so, so what do I want to play next? And I'm not sure exactly why, but I started running through my mind of all the different campaign worlds that I've been in. And I thought, ooh, ooh, Spelljammer. I love sci-fi, you know, I love fantasy. I, I love the mix. I loved it back in the eighties, but I never played it. And uh, I, I just was rolling through my head thinking about different campaign settings and that one popped up and I just got instantly excited about it. And I thought about all these different sci-fi tropes, you know, I love next gen and star Wars and, you know, Star Trek, star Wars, anything. And I just thought of all these different adventure ideas that I could write. And I said, that's it. That's what we're going to do. I'm, we're just going to do um, spell jammer. So. And was it a hard sell for any of your players? Like no, when you brought it up? No, not really. I mean, the, the people in this <clears> game have had virtually no experience with D&D. I think like John had said that he had tried it once in college or something, but basically they had virtually no experience. And I had I had done the the um, Lost Minds of Fandover, the fifth edition starter, mm -hmm. and I had just done that so they could see what it was like. And like I was always a player. I did do a little bit of DMing, but I really really wanted to just be a player i didn't have any interest in being a dm and then i introduced this group of people who hadn't really played before to the game and like it just felt really awesome to be that person who was helping them to get into this hobby which has been a huge part of my life forever and then the next thing i knew i was doing like a twitch thing with a bunch of new players for 
um, for for uh, Extra Life, try to raise money for Boston Children's Hospital. And then every opportunity I had to introduce a new group of players, I was like, just like eager. I was I so badly wanted to do it because, uh, and then I found this love of DMing by basically introducing new players to the game. You know, whereas when I played with my veteran players and I was a DM, like there's just, I mean, I love my friends very much. I'm not trying to diss on them, but there was so much, you know, everybody thinks they know what they're doing. They think their way is the right way. There's so much arguing and infighting. And, and like for me, DMing in that environment wasn't really all that fun. <laughs> you're preaching, you're preaching to the choir for Jason. We actually did a podcast in the last couple of weeks that is absolutely near and dear to my heart. And it is exactly what you just said. <laughs> During COVID, I've had to start gaming with some new groups and I have gamed with a group of brand new players. Like this is their first time. And it is amazing, isn't it? What they bring to the table, the level of energy. <laughs> and actually, there was a point that a bunch of the dungeon masters I interviewed had said it was it is fantastic for older players too, because they become super excited about sharing this hobby they love with these people. And it's yeah. like it totally changed. Oh my it is insane how you have literally <laughs> hit on like probably three of the five points we made in a podcast only a couple of weeks ago. I 100 percent agree with everything you're saying. It's fantastic. <laughs> awesome. And it's just nice to share. And yeah. build. It is, it really is. New players are great, but to bring a new player into Dungeons and Dragons and go, here's spell jammer. I think that's that's not something that it, that many people can say that their first experience with Dungeons and Dragons was a spell ca- spell jammer campaign. True, true. And uh you had asked me what what made me get into it, and then you had a second question. Did I miss that one? Uh I think no. Well, it's just sort of why spell jammer of all the ones you could, but you kind of hit on okay, that. Yeah, like, I so did, you have I a, did. you have a love of like sci-fi and yeah. So in your spell jammer campaign, are we talking about uh, like our laser guns available or, or cause when I played spell jammer, I ran a spell jammer campaign and it was all like, we, we didn't, we didn't add any tech. We just added, uh, we just did like straight spell jammer spells and all the rest of it. We yeah. didn't add any any technological advancements, and uh, we had a blast with it. I really liked it. Um, yeah. So, do do you add those elements of science fiction to it? Uh, what I have done is like I saw in the back of the Dungeon Master's Guide, the Fifth Edition Dungeon Master's Guide, that they had rules for like laser guns, yes, and 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 you know um, grenades and all these different kinds of modern technology and futuristic tech, uh, technology. And I looked at the rules and, you know, what they had there was just way too powerful. If you look at like a laser gun or something or a antimatter rifle, it's like, why would anybody ever have a sword if they could do like 3D6 with this gun at at like a range of like 100 feet? And so what I tried to do is I really sort of tried to flex my uh, homebrew muscles by trying to make uh, a laser pistol, a laser rifle, um, a laser sword. That would all be balanced so that if you were going through the list of equipment and you were making a first level character, that the futuristic weapons that I made would be balanced with all the rest of them. And so that you would basically, there wouldn't be a clear choice. I wouldn't have the whole party with just laser swords because they're not as good as a long sword, depending on what you're trying to do. So I I customized a laser sword, uh, a laser rifle on a laser pistol, and I made up an energy shield. And again, it's not as good as a regular shield, but it's better against laser weapons. So it's kind of like, you know, a balance. So I really just homebrewed the sci-fi stuff and I don't use like the crystal spheres. They just fly out in space. There's no crystal spheres. You can go to any planet you want. You don't have to go through the phlogiston, um, which are people that oh, don't. So there's, there's no like, there's no fire uh, phlogiston no. accidents. That's excellent. No, no. For, for, for people that don't know, basically the spell jammer is based on like you have planetary systems within these crystal spheres and, and, the crystal spheres float in the phlogiston, which is this rainbow colored gaseous kind of very flammable material. And, you know, you can kind of travel from one to the other if it's difficult to do, but I just threw all that out and I've heard other DMs done, have done the same thing. It's basically like the universe is just wide open. You can go to any planet you want. And if you want to say that planet is Greyhawk and that planet is Dragonlance and that planet is Dark Sun, then that's what you do. And so that's what I did. And, I, and I've definitely modified a lot of the rules for Spelljammer. I threw them out the window and uh some of them and i just basically did my own sci-fi homebrew um, element of it but i still kept like you know the air envelopes and the spell jamming helm and a lot of the things that are that are fundamentally spell jammer i kept those and just made some modifications excellent i I love that and i think fifth edition is so good for for um 
homebrewing on that uh, I can see that that would probably be. You almost like homebrew even almost everything you run, even when it's purchased, right? Like, I mean, you always bring an element to it that's you know, yes. sort of outside. Yeah, yeah. yeah. My, my my friend Dan, who introduced me to the game when I was like thirteen, um, he was he's a really good he's a really really good uh, world builder and an excellent storyteller, and he always had some kind of house rules, all the time. Every campaign, he always had something, and it always gave that campaign a certain kind of flavor, something that you remember from just that one campaign. And so I. In, in this current campaign in Spelljammer, I added action points, which was a for, uh, fourth edition thing. And um, but I made up my own rules. I, it's not the same as in fourth edition, but I added in there. And for my next campaign, which I'm thinking of actually doing my first ever completely homebrew setting, um, I'm thinking about this idea of having characters have like a knack, and they choose whatever their knack is at first level, and it could be like. Uh, attack rolls, damage rolls, armor class, uh, movement, initiative, but basically they will get a bonus that gradually increases as you go up a level because that is their knack. And if they really want to change it when they go up a level, I'll let them change it sort of like you can do with feats and other things. Um, but yeah, I mean, I love, I love house rules. I love. Uh, so when you mix in your action points, do you remove inspiration as a mechanic or do you keep that in as well? I, I, I keep it in and, and um, it's interesting that you bring that up because Sometimes the house rules that I've brought in have unintentionally been a little bit too powerful. And then I had to kind of try to readjust and having, having action points and having advantage, you know, there is like a certain game balance that was, that was tweaked in a way that I didn't expect. And so I've had to modify a couple of things to try to balance that out a little bit. You know, I mean, I've heard of situations where inexperienced DMs give people like these artifacts and then they're kicking, kicking ass on everything. So then the DM makes their artifacts get blown up and then the players are all pissed off and they hate, you know, I mean, that's a lot of like very beginner DMs, but, and beginner players, but uh, a smaller degree of that was happening with me where I was like, Hmm, this might be a little bit too powerful. I think even experienced DMs that that begin to, I'm saying this because I've done it. I I think even experienced DMs make errors like that because uh, like, I think you just, you start to experiment with mechanics. Yeah. You start to experiment with some things and then all of a sudden, and you don't necessarily, you can see the immediate effect isn't going to be too bad, but then a few sessions later, you're like, Oh, I'm starting to see a larger, (laughs) like I didn't, I never thought of how that interacts with this or that thing. And then all of a sudden you're like, this is broken. This is broken. So purely player perspective, the neat thing about doing the homebrews is it sort of brings back that whole thing about being a new player again. I'm suddenly playing in in a world or in a situation where I can't recite all the rules. I don't know. The, there's something yes. new. I don't know what this does. I don't know how that interacts. And it, it makes a, a fresh game again. And you're absolutely right. You can plan for everything you want. Players do. I do nothing but think about ways I can utilize something I have in a way maybe somebody didn't see. <laughs> that's from a player's perspective. That's a huge part of the game for me. I love trying to find the, oh my God, I, I guess that works. That is I, always awesome. <laughs> my oldest son plays now and uh for his one for his birthday party uh he asked dad if i have all my friends over can you dm a game for us mm-hmm. i was like i would love to do that for you uh what do you want to do and uh, i forget he said he said just make something up that uh, it, it's got to ha- and i said okay uh, my only rule is then it has to have done dun- a dungeon and it has to have a dragon if we're playing dungeons and dragons and lots of these guys <laughs> haven't played before it has to have a dungeon and it has to have a dragon he was like, sounds great. Do that. I'm like, okay, let's do that. And then um, and then we get this guy who's this kid who's got the spell destroy water. So then he asks me, can I destroy he's they're fighting? And he's like, Can I destroy the water inside the target's eyeballs? <laughs> Essentially blinding him, right? Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> really not the way the spell is supposed to be used and of course my rule lawyer in the back of my mind is going there's already a spell called blindness it's second level he's trying to do it with a first level spell uh anyways <laughs> uh we 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 figured something out i think i think that he's we let we let him do it and uh i think we implied some sort of penalty because the guy had really dry red eyes i immediately thought of the what's the commercial for red eyes with ben oh I'm drawing a blank. It doesn't matter. Uh, anyway, it, it, it was, ve- it, it, it was fun to see some, like none of my regular players would have ever tried. 
pardon me, would have ever tried to destroy someone's eyeball by just destroying <laughs> the water in it. That that's pretty would interesting. Would not have happened. That's would not have happened. Interesting. So do you so 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 for spell jammer, mm-hmm. I just love this setting. Do that's you, great. First of all, is it GIF? Not GIF. I know GIF Yankee gets right. There is a hippo race. Yes, I I, I say. Have GIF. you used them? Yes, I do. I have uh, captain the captain of the ship that they're on. His name is Braun. Um, he is a GIF. He's a, he's like an older GIF, and oh. Captain Braun is a GIF. He's the captain of their ship. There's something about the hippo men, and they're sort of the the artwork that I saw. They were sort of like colonial England. Yeah, basically. and I just. Uh, the jungle book colonel hottie the elephant i'm like i want all my gift to be like him like yeah. that's that's how i pictured him just running this sort of militarized uh hippo brigade and i was like this is fantastic and i and th- i'm i'm sure i'm saying it's fantastic i'm sure there's players out there that go like if i meet a group of hippo men i'm done <laughs> like i'm done with this game yeah, I was looking through the I have the second I have the second edition PDFs and I was looking through all the races and I basically told everybody you can play whatever race that you want because this is, you know, it's space. I mean, you can be anywhere at any time and yeah. and the game is centered on the Rock of Brawl, which is which is like the this center point for the whole Spelljammer campaign. Um it gives you a place um where it's sort of like a home base for the for the players. And so I I described how there's mind flares and beholders and there's gif and there's gith like you said there is a distinction for people that don't know um <laughs> and you know there's there's tabaxi which are the the cat people and um i really like thracrine so I, so the, they're like an insectoid race and so I'm, i included them and i basically made up like like a, a list of crewmen um or, or crew persons and they had as many different races on it as i could think of because i wanted to have them all be part of the crew and I try to take up different voices for some of them, although I'm not going too crazy with all the all the voices, but I try to take up a personality and a little bit of a voice for each one of them. And so they have the players and they have the captain and the crew who are all NPCs. And uh, it's it's definitely been a lot of fun to kind of have the interaction with the people on the crew and whatnot. And, and definitely there is a gif as the captain. Do you utilize the... Do, have you come up with any sort of homebrew for ship-to-ship combat? So far, no. I, I've I thought about it and I said to myself, hmm, that would be really fun. And then I thought, hmm, that's way too much work for what I want to do right now. <laughs> can, can I make it? I'll make a suggestion here. Yes. If you don't have it yet, Ghosts of Salt Marsh has ship stat blocks. It's just like a monster stat block for the ship. Actually, mm-hmm. I, I took, I think I took the stats for the ship from that. Yeah, I think that would be I think that would be a great way to do it. And, uh, I remember, it, it I remember having dog fights. Stuff. Yeah, I remember having yeah. dog fights in uh, old school spell jammer and cr- like ballista rounds and catapult rounds. And the GIF, of course, the hippo men they had cannons, so yes. like it was it was they were even better at uh, at space combat. So the the two things that stand out for for me from spell jammer were the ship to ship combat and. Uh, there was a sort of a mass combat calculator so that if you had two crews, you could sort of make a, it, you sort of took the number of the crew yes, there, yep. and then you added their, I think it was hit dice or something. There was a, there was a math. There was, there a, was a lot of math. There was a, <laughs> there was a math uh, <laughs> formula so that you could have these large scale combats yep. with your ships. And I, and I always, I actually, long after I stopped playing Spelljammer, I still referred back to their mass combat rules for some of my games. Yeah, they have they have the mass combat rules um, even f- in the back of the Fifth Edition Dungeon Master's Guide for for crowds, mm-hmm. for groups, mm-hmm. and um, and, I, and I think I did pull my ship stats from Ghost of Salt Marsh, and you know the ship has ballista and it has catapult on it, and they've used it against things against creatures that were flying toward the ship. And um, but I haven't had to actually ship the ship yet because I want to do it in a way that is very uh, fantastic, and I don't want them to be just like throwing rocks from one ship to another or shooting mm-hmm. giant arrows from one ship to the other. I want it to be something more spectacular than that. So I haven't really pulled the trigger on it and put the work into it just yet because I, I just I want to make it really cool. And you know, life life is making it a little bit difficult sometimes. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. But but I do want to do a ship to ship battle at some point with them, and I want to make it really exciting. And I'm not going to pull the trigger until I really feel like it's going to be good. 
So I've got a million other science fiction tropes that I can use in the What's meantime. the level of the party in that game? Right now, the party is, uh, honey, you're seventh level, right? Seventh. Seventh yeah. level, yeah. Seventh. My, lo- my lovely wife and my baby are behind me. Uh, baby's getting a change. <laughs> um, uh, Kate, is who's a player in the game, uh, they just hit seventh level. Is where they're nice. at. And, and I, I was actually, I, I jumped all over the place with the leveling at first because I wanted them to experience XP because I hadn't done XP in the first like three or four campaigns that we had had with them starting in 2015. I wanted them to have XP. They were using the point by system. And I said, I want you guys to roll abilities. I want you guys to have the experience that I had. I want you to have to roll your abilities. I want you to get XP. I want you to feel what that is is like. So we, we did all that and we were playing for a while. And then I was like, okay, I'm sick and tired of calculating XP. <laughs> so then so then I just started basically going to like a three a three adventure system where they will be a level for three adventures and then go to the next level and then three adventures. And prior to that, in the years starting from 2015 to like 2019, I had done one level every adventure. And that was because me as myself, like our games would always collapse so much sooner than I wanted over a period of 30, 35 years of playing. I never got to see 20th level. And I was so annoyed that I never got to see 20th level. So for the first three campaigns, they were going up all over every adventure and they got to 20th and played there for like three or four adventures before we switched. And I was like, I want you guys to be able to see the entire arc. Um, mm-hmm. But that wound up creating problems because the advancement was so fast that people couldn't really keep up. And, sure. and, and, I, and I, took that, I took that sort of feedback from my players and I said, okay, well, why don't, why don't I do XP next time? And then I just started to get bored with XP and I said, okay, how about we have a compromise between XP and leveling every adventure? And so I started to do the three, the three, the three adventure leveling thing now. I think, I think XP, XP is an interesting, that, that, take a note, Jason, (laughs) we, we need, we need a podcast about experience points. Cause I think experience points were something that old school players really like. They like the grind. Yeah. There's something about that, that they really like, they really get a kick out of. But newer players that I've played with, like, they want nothing to do with it. They're yeah. just like, you tell the, st- I just want to, I'm here for, I guess it's the difference. The, a new player is there for the story. Mm-hmm. An old school player is there for the game, if that yeah. makes sense. No, I understand. And, yeah. and, and that is a horror, like, like, I'm obviously painting with very broad strokes here, but right. because I'm sure there's people in opposite camps. Yes. But, I think it's interesting that experience points has be, kind of become cumbersome for mm-hmm. some people. And, you know, we play a old school uh, game uh, on Thursday nights with some, with some guys and we're putting experience points that there's 10 players in the party. I DM <laughs> that we got 10 players. It's That's a very, lot. <laughs> it, it is a lot. It is a lot. And, uh, we're using a very old set of clone rules and experience points in there. Like they, they put, they did the math together and they're, they're like the number of things we have to kill to go up a level. Like it's not happening. Right. It's a long way off. So I think, you know, everybody likes to level leveling is exciting. Like it's fun. Yeah. But I get what you mean that if you did it every adventure, then maybe you don't get time to even sort of learn the mechanic before exactly. you're on to the next mechanic that your character gets. Exactly. I try to always check in with my players because, um, you know, I, I don't just want to be like, I mean, a dungeon master runs the kind of games that they want to play in, which is kind of like the the blessing and the curse of a DM. I mean, I want to be in a spell jammer game, but I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm not playing it and I'm running it. Yeah. Um, and, but I want the players to have input. I want them to feel like they're affecting the game not just inside but on the outside if they're not having fun leveling every adventure if it's too much for them mm-hmm. then i want them to tell me and I, and I take that feedback and i try to either implement it immediately in that campaign or save it for the next campaign do you find that your spell jammer campaign gives you the opportunity to access monsters that wouldn't normally be accessed in a D campaign because when i started dming it like mind flare not lloyd's uh yeah. beholder orb ships and uh, even the neo guy yeah uh these are monsters that in a regular campaign you don't see for quite some time yep. but in spell jammer you have an opportunity to just kind of go like there's a beholder ship in port and they're trading yeah yeah absolutely yeah i mean i use neogi in the very first adventure they they 
they, they got off their ships, um, their transport ships, and they went up and I described sort of like the way the Rock of Brawl looked. And, you know, it was a busy city full of all these different races. And then there was a bunch of Neogi that got off one of the ships behind them. And they tried basically this really stupid invasion plan. <laughs> and, 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 and they got their asses kicked by, by a bunch of the people that were just on the street as well as the party. Everybody started pulling out laser guns and laser swords. And, and they just attacked this, this uh, ill-fated group of Neogi. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I just, I use them right away in the first adventure. Uh, and I'm using one of the characters from the book, which is a, a beholder barkeep named Luigi. And so, so <laughs> right in the first adventure, I, I think it was the first adventure, but very early on, they met, they met Luigi, the, the beholder bartender at the laughing beholder tavern. And he's been a character and I, and I love role-playing him. He's a lot of fun. And and the last adventure or the one before last, he even got to kick some ass using his, um, his eye stocks because there was another there was another episode that I had with the Neogi, but this time they came with a bigger force. And in the middle of this giant invasion, um, Luigi comes out uh, of 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 the of the bar. You know, spoilers for anybody that hasn't <laughs> read the, or listened to the episode. And he comes out like shooting his eye stocks like all over the place and just like wiping out Neogi. You know, so yeah, I love using the the monsters, the unique monsters t- to uh, spell jammer. And you know, someone listening is going to say, "I can put a beholder in my bar if I want to." Sure. Well, yeah, you can, but I feel like spell jammer goes. Uh, here's the stereotype, but we're going to turn it a bit, and yes. you're like, so you know, yep. mind flares are more common out in space. So, yep. so here's a really spooky scary uh monster that you maybe don't get to see that much and all of a sudden now here it is and you can run into the not lloyd fleets a lot uh and here's the beholders and and and, you know it just kind of uh i just like the way it goes like these are normally monsters that you only like oh if we ever fight one of those we're dead and (laughs) and now here you go here they are yeah there's an illithid there's a mind flare embassy on the rock you know so they're so illithids are like walking around you know mind flares and Normally you're like, oh my god, that thing's gonna eat my brain, <laughs> you know, or the or the beholder is gonna turn me to stone. But they all exist on the Rock of Brawl, and it's cool. Nobody wants to, you know, uh, piss off, you know, uh, Prince Andrew, the guy who's running the Rock. They want to have their trade sanctions. They want to be able to trade with other races and and have a place to talk about wars and or whatever they want to talk about. And so everybody just kind of keeps the peace, and it's really, it's really fun. <laughs> Jason, did you like, have something? You, when you fall into a lot of sort of the standard games that we've played over the years, it really is a rotating list of about 12 monsters, right? <laughs> that seem to come up for 80% of the encounters. Sure. And I think that's the one neat thing about sort of when you get into some of the different um, the different campaign settings and stuff. is it's, it's nice to mix it up. It goes back to being sort of a new player. Like, the, it isn't just goblins, kobolds, skeletons, and orcs. Like, right. we are going to see something that was in the back pages of that book the pages were still crisp because you never needed to use it, right? <laughs> yep. All of a sudden, uh, it, there's so much content out there that maybe doesn't see the play it could pull, or the play it deserves. Yeah. And, uh, I think these these sort of campaign settings allow a dungeon master to really sort of draw on all that fantastic stuff that's just sitting there waiting to be used. Right. That that's that's another reason why I wanted to do the Spelljammer campaign settings is because there's so much there that never gets used and i'm like i'm going to try to use as much of this as possible until i get <laughs> like sick of it and just use all of it as much as i can and get it worked in there and th- there's just so much stuff that i can do i'm, I'm excited to see where the campaign goes i have no G- idea how long it's going to last but we'll see gith yankee are yeah. fa- a favorite of mine yeah the gith the gith yankee but they the never Yankees. work their way into my campaigns no <laughs> But a spell jammer campaign, you're gonna find a Gith Yankee pirate. You're go- like they're going to be there. I'm yeah. going to make sure they're in there because this is my opportunity. And I think you know we were going to talk about some other second edition settings. We haven't really gotten to them, but yeah, yeah, I think spell jammer. I think spell jammer came out of the fact that second edition kind of flooded the market with a lot of different settings, and spell jammer was second edition's way of saying they can all be connected. Yes, exactly. Like if 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 you're buying, you don't have to buy just one. It's sort of a sales <laughs> pitch. You don't have to buy just one line of campaign settings. You can buy them all and then connect them with a spell jammer setting. Right. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. I think I think that's uh, brilliant marketing. Brilliant marketing. Was it brilliant marketing? I don't know. I think it's inter- <laughs> I think it's interesting. 
we're going to talk about some of the other campaign settings that came out of second edition and yeah. Jason's going to take us even back to first, but your example of first is it, it made its mark in second as well, mm-hmm. but I it's interesting that second, second edition yeah. created all these settings third, not so much. No, uh, not really. And, and fourth again, no, not, not so much. Fifth, no. no, but the, like even forgotten realms sort of, it got its box set, I think in second Maybe it was first. I'm not, but it definitely in second. Yeah. And from there, like I don't know what it was about second edition, but that was. It's kind of a, magi- say, a magical time. <laughs> I think it was. I think. It, I think. It, I think that's one of the reasons that fifth. I like so much is because it. I feel it has a lot of connections to second, and I think second edition was a bit of a golden age. It's yep. very easy to introduce players to second edition D&D, in my opinion. Yep. I introduced tons of people to D&D through uh, the second edition age. So Yeah, when I think well, about I, D&D, I'm, I'm, like ex- I'm excited about, about your Spelljammer game. I, I, I cool. even think I might have to revisit it myself. <laughs> I just... I really like it. I really yeah. like it. So you guys had mentioned... You had mentioned the, the Lankmar setting. Yes. And I, I had never heard of it. Like I was surprised. I thought I thought like you know I'm not like a expert on D and D, but I know a lot about it. And when you had said that, I'm like I have no idea what that is. So I had to go look it up. So I'm really excited to hear about that. That's a segue. Let's do it. <laughs> okay. So Blank Mar for me really, and I'm a, a primarily first edition player. I quit playing probably. At all, I can remember some of my friends buying the second edition of books. At that point in time, I was turning 19. I'm not going to go into the details, but at 19, things change in your life, and you suddenly spend a little less time gaming with your friends. Understood. <laughs> okay, there we go. Okay, you know what? Then you're a unicorn, because most of us who were playing D&D were like, that other portion of the life you're talking about, not so easily accessed for the guy playing first edition. <laughs> you, you, you poor man, you. We, we've talked about we're going, This is a totally different book. Either way, for me, Blankmar was, was home. It really was. It was... We had played a lot of first edition, and the and in first edition, you you had your standard dungeon crawls. Greyhawk came out. There was these mass wilderness things. You we played the heck out of them. You know, you played every weekend, all weekend, and then all of us and we were reading fantasy, right? Fantasy novels were coming out. Things were starting to generate and appendix, and you start looking back to some stuff and you discover Fritz Lieber. Okay, wait a minute. And uh, do we, we know what appendix this. N is? Because Chris might not know. I didn't know. No. Nope. Nope. So in the back of the original Dungeon Master's Guide, there was a series of appendices. One of them was Appendix N, which listed a series of science fiction and fantasy novels that Gygax drew inspiration from okay. in creating. And so he made a list of books like, hey, here's a bunch of books I read that really influenced me. If you really want to know about D&D, here, here's a list of, I want to say, maybe been 50 or more books. Awesome. Um, like these are, and so... You started stumbling across, you know, I discovered Lovecraft, I discovered, um, you know, Tolkien, all the standards. And then Fritz Lieber was, in terms of being a young teenage boy, Faffer and the Grey Mauser, are, there's, they're cooler, there's swagger. And it, <laughs> it was the first time where you had, we had spent all this time dungeon delving and all of a sudden a campaign setting comes out and it is a city. And it is not, the map in Lankmar alone <laughs> was the most fascinating thing. It is a full size tabletop map, individually hand drawn, individual buildings, alleys, courtyards, a massive urban setting, mm-hmm. in a very low fantasy game. Very little magic, very little magic items, strictly human races. Okay. Um, lots of political intrigue, lots of sort. So there's yeah, there no, there no, no elves there's no dwarves no elves. dwarves and elves are things that live out on the edges of mankind oh, okay gotcha they're not optional as a player race neither really were they had the same sort of cor- a very similar corruption system if you wanted to play a magic user at, at certain levels you just started rolling deformities and defects like <laughs> drawing upon these dark powers it started corrupting your body I think I think the actual rules, because you know I'm a rules lawyer. Uh, the actual rules for Lankmar said that wizards could not go past fifth level. Really, so I, fourth level and higher spells were in the game, but it required certain sacrifices on behalf of the wizard 
to gain that knowledge? Well, Wizards and Illusionists became Black Wizards, and Clerics and Druids became White Wizards, which were even rarer. Mm -hmm. um, Interesting. So it was a... We had talked about this in the movie thing too, sort of um, Philippe Gaston the Mouse. The, and then you get Stafford's iconic characters, the Grey Mouser. So he's taking it even a step further. He's he's a rogue. He studied a bit as a magician. He's got a couple of spells up his sleeve. Um, and then they take the whole sort of seedy underworld of the city and it's going to be fighting between sort of the, the Thieves Guild, the Assassin's Guild, and various uh, churches. And it becomes sort of a political setting. It was a really refreshing change. It was a different type of story when module after module and setting after setting was, you know, Caves of Chaos or a take on that. Um, it, I'm not sure why it sticks with me or even today it still resonates with me. Um, I've recently started playing in a first edition campaign again that's very much has this feel to it. And you're like, this is such a great thing because it wasn't even just the low magic. It's like, well, you're in a city, like, you can't wear a suit of armor in a city. If you're wearing a suit of armor in a city, the constable is going to pull you over because you're obviously up to no good. There's no reason for somebody to have a weapon or a suit of armor in a city. Everything was very subterfuge. Like there was... That wasn't the case in Lankmar, though. I think it was the case in Lankmar. As I think you could carry you could carry blades and stuff in Lankmar. I think the common people carried a knife. I actually just had the rules out a minute ago. <laughs> But uh, you would you may have to bribe some people occasionally to have a sword. And I think would... it, if you know if you want to know if you're right for a Lankmar game, I think Fritz Lieber, who created the world, not not anything to do with Dungeons and Dragons, he was a pulp sword and wizardry author, mm -hmm. and I stumbled into him because um, I I'm a big Neil Gaiman fan, and Neil Gaiman on an interview or something he was talking to someone he began to talk about fritz lieber and his love of mr lieber's writing so i just i went and checked it out and uh very short stories because it's pulp fiction and all about fafford and the gray mauser and a barbarian and a rogue adventuring through this month they're even more city. than that though like Faff great the gray mauser does a stint as a magic user's apprentice and becomes a rogue and if and actually they were statted the two characters were statted out in the first edition legend and lore uh or that, deities yeah. and demigods rather legend lore yep. uh, became yeah and they had multiple levels in multiple classes yes so even though you don't have um you don't have dwarves elves demi-humans in that setting the human characters were not were supposed to be sort of jack of all trades like they had a couple levels in wizard. They had a couple levels in rogue. They had a couple levels in fighter. They maybe had a couple levels in ranger. Like they were all over the place. Bafford was a level 15 ranger, a fifth level bard, and a fifth level thief. You have that there? I have it right here. The great <laughs> was a 10th level fighter, a, ten, a 15th level thief, nice. and a third level magic user. <laughs> Multiclassing, man. Eh? Multiclassing. <laughs> oh, look at you. That's right out of that book. That's right out of that book. Uh, and also the, the yeah, and then that's the, the new that one got the multi class. I think that was the last yeah, the which was really neat. It was a there was a very small pantheon, um, mm -hmm. and they were really involved with everyday life. Like the gods might ask you to do something for them, right? There was sort of that, you know, the uh, city. The city, Lankmar had these gods that were these undead beings that lived under the city and they had their hands in all the thieves guilds. Like if you love, if you want a campaign that's in a city with lots of guilds and lots of competition Political between the guilds. And then on top of that, there's this under city that lurks below where the gods of Lankmar sort of lurk these undead. There's actually a great piece of artwork with their, it looks like they're liches. There's like four or five of them. It's an old school piece of artwork it, it's actually a depiction of the the gods of lankmar and uh and uh, you know what else just hit me uh the map that, that you, you were talking about the gorgeous yeah. map it had the the but it had blank spaces in it where the dm mm -hmm. had geomorphs he could plug in <laughs> and the so idea like, was they should change blocks, because you would have to venture into the heart of that city block to find out what like maybe there was that's a right Maybe there was a, a shrine and a well, right? There was sort of... But like... it wasn't necessarily the same when you came back because the idea is the city's constantly changing and evolving. Oh, really? That, that's yeah. cool. 
that's that like cool. buildings are being torn down or fires happen or the map so then you plug in a different awesome. geomorph the next it's time they're there i'm gonna try and post on instagram but it's 100 percent was a huge selling feature for us because you could be looking at a map just like a dungeon map and go okay we're going to take the alley on the right and that's going to take us to that courtyard and it showed the levels of the buildings. Well, we can access the first story of that building to the roof. From there, we can hack into the alley on the backside. So it was a very rogue-driven campaign. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of it, by fondness, falls on the dungeon master who ran it in that he ran a series of campaigns that were like, there's um, the, the Thieves Guild versus the Assassin's Guild fighting for dominance in the city. Mm -hmm. And you think, okay, you remember the Thieves Guild. And, but um, magic is very low too, right? Like if, some, if someone shows up with a glowing sword... Out, like, fight somebody and they would pull a sword and it would be glowing you would be like this is one of the most powerful people in the city like we should probably run nobody owns a plus one sword and it was anything in that and we talked about this with dm uh with judge brian and grognards is there was no such thing as it wasn't just a plus one sword it was night whisper the plus one sword or it was you know heart seeker the plus one bow um there was never just it wasn't just a, a wear rat or a lich it was you know Everybody was named. There yeah, was, was named, yeah. Generic, right? Because the Fantastic was so rare, it sort of, it became elevated in status. Even things that sort of would have just been, you know, brushed off as mobs. I, I could yeah. see the appeal of that if you were playing the game and, and there was so, it was so low magic. And then when something would come along, it was named or somebody had a, a unique power, they were named. It was something very special. And then you, you fight and you receive that and you're like, this is my sword. Like, I am... Um, you know, who's the, the who's the I'm big the who's the big wizard? I want to say something like Ningobel of the Eleven Eyes or something, and he's like a tenth level wizard, but he's been so mutated by magic, he now has all his, he has like ten eyes on an eye on eye stalks, and he keeps a hood up over his head. Like <laughs> it's really creative stuff. And if you have a chance, it's definitely worth reading. Fritz Lieber stuff is really light, easy to read. Mm -hmm. There's no fluff; it's action packed. Like it's. It's two young adventurers in a big city, and they adventure. They adventure out of the city. There's and it's it's all on it's all on audiobook as well. You can get all of Fritz Lieber's works on audiobook. If you are a commuter, uh, they are short pulp fiction pulp stories. Like you can get through a story on your commute to work or home from work. So uh, a little darker, a little grittier, low magic. Um, mm -hmm. which, Part of the, I was like super excited when we started talking about this because I'm like, we're really talking about three very different campaign settings. I mean, you're talking when you think of Spelljammer, Dragonlance, and, and, and for me, Lankmar, those are three absolute ends of the spectrum. Those have been pushed as far as part as possible. One is you know, a mass market high fantasy setting, yeah. another one is a is really wonderful, wonky sort of sci fi all-encompassing setting and then sort of just an old school low magic sort of really setting this is a good tie-in to spell jammer though um appendix n which you mentioned appendix n which you mentioned that gary gygax pulled from a lot of that early swords and sorcery type of uh fiction had science fiction mixed in like there were always portals to other worlds now, we're not talking about like other planes like it's not a portal to hell it's a portal to another world on the other side of the universe uh and and uh finding like strange uh equipment uh from other worlds uh, how does it operate how does it work again spelljammer can just pull, like pull all that stuff and that's coming from original uh, D and D uh, sources. Uh, what was the adventure that I think did Gygax right? Expedition to the Barrier Peaks. Mm -hmm. Expedition to the Barrier Peaks is a is a crash spacecraft. Yes, there's laser Spell guns and everything craft, in yeah. it. Yeah, yep. it's it's <laughs> totally going to where Spelljammer eventually gets in a, in the earliest forms of Dungeons and Dragons, and mm -hmm. most recently Monty Cook uh, and his. Uh, gaming company brought out uh, Numenera, which is a role playing game, but they've gone on to do I forget the name of the book, but it's basically bringing science fiction into your Dungeons and Dragons games uh, and strange of, technology and weirdness. Back when he was developing Dungeons and Dragons, the prevalence of fantasy fiction compared to science fiction fiction 
there was a, there was a severe imbalance. I mean, you had to draw from the sources you had, and science fiction was hot. I mean, it started in the fifties and started hard. I mean, it encompassed a lot more than sort of uh, the classic fantasy genre. So, I mean, you were to be able to look at that and sort of just morph it or modify it and um, and bring it into a fantasy world was it was a real talent for sure. But I think you work with the resources you had, and that was probably a predominant number of the sources. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Jeremy, do you want to? Would you want to talk about what was your campaign setting of choice? My, my campaign setting is Dragonlance. Yeah, daddy, aren't you? My this, cra- it, it, it's Dragonlance, and it's Dragonlance. what? This was the big one. They, I mean, they had a lot resting on this. This was huge. Well, it's the first set of novels that that Dun- TSR puts out. I think and, I could be wrong, but uh, did they do Gorda Greyhawk? Yeah, but I don't know if that came before or after Hickman and Weiss started writing the original Dragonlance series. When did the Dark Elf trilogy come out? That was that Forgotten Realms? Uh that's Dark, Forgotten Realms. Dark Elf trilogy. Uh, okay. Do you mean are you talking Crystal Shard and all that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that that's okay. well after that's okay. well after Dragonlance. Okay. Uh, well, Dragonlance has everybody here read the Dragonlance novels? I have not. Yeah, I obviously have, but can I say something? The I want to say the first the first two trilogies, the first six books. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, you got to read. Absolutely. Crit- if you get a chance. And you don't even have to go the first six, the first three. The time of the twins. The well, twins I know trilogy. everybody likes the twins trilogy, but I'm, I'm, I'm still stuck in the first trilogy. I like the first trilogy, the war but of the just, lands. Just beautiful, beautiful dungeons and dragons stuff. And then the second one, sort of that sort of, I've advanced beyond just the, the thrill of the adventure that the interpersonal story and the, uh, uh, the I, either way, I'm not going to go and spoil anything. Dragon <laughs> Balls, the first six books, probably awesome. six of the best sort of fantasy novels I read at that age in my life. I'm not mm-hmm. sure. I haven't reread them. I'm not sure how they hold up now. Um, I, I've reread them recently and they would be good for, I, I don't think, you don't need to be that old to read them. Okay. Then, I think I think it, 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 if you wanted to call them young, um, they would young be like fiction. Young, young adult uh, fiction now. Yeah. Yeah. So, so so what is the basic like premise behind the Dragon Man's campaign setting? Okay. So I I'll, I'll tell you what my first of all uh, my draw. Mm-hmm. To the to to Dragon Lance, yeah. because I didn't even know what Dragon Lance was about when I first found it was the art. Uh, the, the the art is uh, uh, the, didn't Larry spectacular. Elmore, didn't Larry Elmore do a bunch of art for that? Uh, I know Larry Elmore did do a bunch of art. Yeah. I think Larry Elmore was the primary guy that was given was say, Dragon was Lance as his part. art project. Yeah, I, I met him at a convention. I got him to sign my DM. Did screen. you? My advanced second, my advanced Dungeons Dragon second mission oh, DM screen. Amazing. I got him to sign it. Oh. So. I run a <laughs> I run a fundraiser uh, for uh, cystic fibrosis. My daughter has cystic fibrosis, mm-hmm. so I run a fundraiser and I reached out to Mister Elmore one year and he sent me two two what prints. What's that? Hey, with the fundraiser is. Let's do a shout out. This is awesome. The fundraiser is called Heroes for CF and uh, and it's basically a fundraiser for cystic fibrosis, which my daughter has. And uh, yeah, it's, it's Dungeons and Dragons marathon. It's a Dungeons and Dragons marathon, and it's nice. uh, the more money you raise, the more good loot I give your character, and then you run you run the day. Uh, That's a great idea. It, yeah, we started. It started up. We could do a whole subject on it, but let's not get <laughs> sidetracked on it. I love here, talking about here's for CF, but I'm really worried if I start down that trail, I will. I'll <laughs> it's, just it's never come back. Going. So, so Dragon Lance, the artwork grabbed me, and uh, as well. Uh, we have uh, is it i always i'm bad with names but tracy uh laura and tracy hickman worked on it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and laura and uh specifically tracy hickman uh is also responsible for ravenloft and ravenloft right was <laughs> a favorite module of mine so awesome. so here here i've got these these uh and and I got hooked on Dragonlance kind of like Jason did with his Lankmar in first edition. So my love with Dragonlance starts in first edition when they start putting out these modules that retrace the novels. And it ends up being like a 14, 15. What, 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 what are you pointing your finger at me for? Have you read the novels before you or there was a novel? I hadn't. I hadn't. 
Really? I was dr- I was drawn. So I'm in my gaming. I'm in my gaming store. I'm in my gaming store, and I see the cover for Dragons of Despair. And I'm going to see if I can find it here quick for you while I talk. So I see the cover of Dragons of Despair, and I'm like, I need to run this module. Like this is. I don't know what this is. Uh, I don't know what Dragon Lance is. So I take Dragon Lance home, and now I'll sort of tell you. So. So here's what Dragonlance is for someone who's never played. The Dragonlance stories start off, and I'm going to give you the tales from for War of the Lance because that's where there's so many ages you can play here. But in War of the Lance, there are no clerics. This is the artwork. Cool. This in particular piece I love. Yep. So War of the Lance starts, there's no clerics. And the story is that your party, the first module... Your party has, uh, they're all about between third and fifth level now, and your party has gone out all over the world trying to find signs of true healing magic. Uh, They can't find any. They all come back and come back to their hometown of uh, Solus, and they... uh, they share their stories of the world that they found. And while they're there, the war kicks off, and they find true cleric magic. And uh, from there, the story just sort of unravels and, and turns into a massive saga. And if you run the modules, they're very exciting. I've never run them all fully, but the first sort of five modules I have run numerous times with friends. And I think that's where the bit of nostalgia comes from me is I can remember sitting around friends' houses doing weekend long marathons, staying up to ridiculous hours in the morning <laughs> and we were playing these dragon lance adventures and and the artwork was fantastic so everybody at the table got to see that 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 gorgeous stuff that larry elmore put out mm-hmm. and it gave us all a frame of reference um and mm-hmm. dragons play a very prominent role for a game called Dungeons and Dragons, not many people's adventures actually have dragons in them anymore. <laughs> That's true. Anymore. That's true. I, I mean, if you're a DM and you've run a, a couple campaigns, really think how many times have I had a dragon in there? <laughs> there is a dragon in every like. That's a, that's another thing. Dragons have disappeared from the world, and all of a sudden they all come back. Uh, they okay. took Tiamat and they changed her into an evil dragon goddess named Takesis. And oh, Takesis, that sounds familiar. <laughs> yes, so Takesis is Dragonlance's Tiamat. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the Dragonlance world, gold and silver are nothing. You collect steel. Uh, your coins are steel coins because uh, steel can be made into weapons. And you're, you know, during this is during a war. And uh, what was the level of magic like? Was it high, low? Ridiculously middle? high. Exactly. So it's ridiculously high, but it has. It has it, the magic in Dragonlance has has its own set of rules. So there are three moons. Uh, each moon uh, is a god or goddess of magic, and they c- lawful neutrality and evil. A uh, good, good maybe not lawful. A uh, good neutrality and evil. Sure. And then depending on where the moons are in the sky affects your spell casting in the early editions of uh, of Dragonlance. As well, when you reach the ability to cast, I want to say third level spells, you have to go to the Towers of High Sorcery to do your testing. And then you are just like just like in uh, Harry Potter, you are given you're either a black robed evil wizard, a red robed <laughs> neutral wizard or a white robed good wizard. Mm hmm. And if you do not go to the Towers of High Sorcery and continue to practice magic, you know, they, the understanding is that magic is so powerful that you become what, what they call a renegade wizard. And uh, renegade wizards have to be hunted down by the Tower of High Sorcery wizards to, uh, to be brought to justice. Um, elves play a big role. Uh, dwarves uh, play an interesting role. Uh, they, they are very much like the dwarves that you know, Tolkien introduces us to, uh, but uh, with a little bit of a twist, there's a couple sub races of dwarves. Gully dwarves are everyone's favorite from Dragonlance because there's these sort of gully dwarves can't count above two. So it doesn't matter what they're dealing with. They can't count above two. <laughs> um, what else is there? The, this is this Kender. Is that what you said? 
Not the Kender. I think it was that was the introduction of the Kender race. That was, exactly. that was like a halfling kind of, right? There is no halflings. There are only Kender. Okay, yeah. And Kender, yeah. and Kender is like a halfling dialed up to eleven. Uh, <laughs> you all like Kender a- borrow things. <laughs> all and the other thing about Kender are they they cannot feel fear. They just don't understand what that is. Uh, so game mechanically, you are never frightened. You're never afraid of anything. Uh, just So just imagine a curious, need to pickpocket everything, uh, not afraid of anything like, oh, my friends are over there. Well, they won't. They don't mind if I just sneak off over here and check this out. Like the, the, And Tasselhoff Burfoot is the sort of... Uh, the kender of the party for the for the uh, fellowship of the lands I, I think it's an important part about the novels in case you know, it really covers all the archetypes right like every character mm-hmm. trope that you're going to see in mm-hmm. Dungeons and dragons is a member of this party right you, you have the knight who's you know sworn to a code you have mm-hmm. you know you have the the, the steadfast old old dwarf you know and, and his family and his fatherly view you have the mischievous um, sort of rogue, and then in some neat stuff. You can... Uh oh, you guys froze. Oh no! Fantastic characters. Did we lose you? Yeah, the, you guys froze for about for about uh, for about ten seconds there. <laughs> so I just I, the last thing I heard you say was that was that they had the basically the quintessential party of of different characters there. Yeah, and. Then, and and that was a cool thing about buying the modules is that the all the characters from the books were in the back of the modules. So you could actually play the characters from the books and they had all kinds of supporting artwork with it. As I said, Dragonlance, just picking up those modules, that artwork firmly cemented you into the world of Dragonlance. There, there are no orcs in Dragonlance. There are goblins, but not orcs. And there are the dreaded Draconians, which are sort of the oh, earliest yeah, forms Draconians. of Dragonborn. Yeah, they always and every die draconian in, in some interesting yeah. way they always die in some that's interesting right way. <laughs> exactly every draconian has some sort of death rattle it doesn't go out <laughs> just dead it has something where like it turns to stone and your weapons stick in it they turn to a pool of acid they yeah, explode, explode. <laughs> yeah yeah so so the this the story of uh dragon lance uh, it came after for me it was the artwork and the modules having so much like when you open these modules up the maps were incredible mm-hmm. uh and you have and you have hickman uh writing them and uh i mean he's 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 good i mean there's nothing <laughs> he's good he, he and the ones he didn't write he sort of oversaw is my understanding um and and so that i mean just dragons imagine you're you know everybody wants a hero that rides a dragon everybody wants a hero that that (laughs) like the drag the dragon is their friend or uh, there's just so much there that's like sort of quintessential dungeons and dragons for me that uh that that uh dragonlance i will say though that the downfall here is that i'm i'm intimidated to run dragonlance now because you're messing with canon and (laughs) i'm like i'm like do i want to step in there and mix that up sometimes and sometimes canon can be intimidating for i didn't run forgotten realms for the longest time because i hadn't read a lot of forgotten realms and i i knew my players had read forgotten realms stuff and i was like they're going to call me on something like, Hey, that's not <laughs> how it works here. Uh, it's the same reason that I have a hard time jamming star Wars role-playing games It's because I, I love star Wars, but you know, someone out there is always a bigger expert than you. And there's going to be a piece of Canon that you trip up on <laughs> and they're going to call you on it. And then you're, you know, it's fine to say, well, it's your world and you do it. You like, but there's still a piece of you that goes, yeah, but I really wanted it to be, on the mark and yeah so i mean and i think dragon lance of the three campaign settings we're talking about i think it's the most maybe it's the most maybe stereotypical sure it it it, it certainly has a homebrew feel where like okay there's no halflings there's kender and uh you know there's no even the paladin class is not available there's uh, Mm -hmm. a knight class the knights of solemnia uh, and they have all different orders that you can choose to join as well but 
Uh, but I feel like it's it's as sort of it's vanilla D and D turned up, and <laughs> it's uh, it's probably the furthest from uh, Lankmar. I mean, high magic in Dragonlance is time traveling and and all all kinds <laughs> of stuff going on. Whereas <laughs> Lankmar is like, if you cast that magic missile spell, you might grow a third eye. So be careful. <laughs> And That's then awesome. Spelljammer, I mean Spelljammer, the, 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 it's limitless, the ends of uh, what you can do with Spelljammer. I think that's one of the great things about Spelljammer. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's one of the reasons why I'm running it. I'm very excited about that. And, you know, this has been a, a great discussion, you know, and I'm really excited because I didn't know anything about Lankmar at all. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. um, and, I, and you brought back a lot of things that I remember from Dragonlance too, uh, like, like the Draconians that, that, that was something that was burned into my brain. When you brought it up, I was like, oh my God, I remember hating fighting those things. <laughs> if anyone plays World of Warcraft out there and you ride Griffins if you're the Alliance and you ride Wyverns if you're the Horde, you have Dragonlance to thank for that. The bad guys <laughs> had Griffin stations where they rode from uh, battlefield to battlefield and the good guys had uh, sorry, the good guys had Griffin stations and the bad guys had Wyvern stations. So <laughs> So if you if you play that, that's I think that's lifted directly from directly from Dragonlands. Awesome, awesome, cool. So is uh, is there anything else you guys uh, want to talk about real quick? I mean, we've done about a little over an hour, I think. Here we've had a really good discussion. This has been uh, an awesome cross promotion. Again, I did this with like one other group, uh, and that was that was a lot of fun. But we didn't go in depth as much as we did here. And um, so I mean, I'm really excited that you guys wanted to come and do this. Maybe we can do it again in the future. I mean, this has been this has been a, a huge, huge pleasure for me. So I hope you guys have had fun. Yeah, no, I have, Jay. And we totally get sidetracked. Horrible. We're like, no, that, that's okay. We're getting sidetracked. <laughs> times where we're like, did we just cover three topics? I think we covered three topics. <laughs> we did. Uh, it's a very <laughs> loose thing, and I mean, it's it's just not, like I said, we've talked about this. It's all about community building. It's fantastic to talk to other people who are passionate about the same thing you're passionate about. Yeah. And I guess the fact that the current situation in the world has resorted to us doing this electronically kind of sucks in terms of gameplay, but it also mm-hmm. opens up the fact that we've talked to people that we would maybe never have had the opportunity to talk to or never would have thought to talk to. I mean, because we're um, crossing a border here, right? Because uh, if maybe the listeners have already noticed, but uh, new dude to boot it here right. in Canada. Uh, we, yeah. we, I mean, I don't think I have an accent. I don't Chris think you do either. Chris doesn't Before have an accent. We did this, I actually went online and looked up because you're in New Hampshire. Yes, we're in New Hampshire. And this is going to sound, I'm going to, you don't want to throw it out there. As uh, There's a very Canadian thing when you think about America, you're like, they don't know anything about us. The, the, well, the Americans don't know about Canadians. And then they're like, New Hampshire? I don't know anything about New Hampshire. <laughs> and you're like, that makes, I am what I think other people are. Right. This, this will blow some people's New minds. Hampshire, it is possible that. Almost in Canada. You literally share okay. a border with Quebec. Yeah, I've I mean I've driven up I've driven up to to the border and crossed over a couple times. <laughs> it's entirely possible that Chris is further north than you and I. We are. He te- I looked at him out. He is technically further north. I am. Geographically, <laughs> we are in the bottom part of southern Ontario. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Someone out there, someone out there listening, just got their mind blown. <laughs> How could it be? I, I was like, I was like, New Hampshire. I'm like, I know kind of where it is, but I didn't know a lot about it. And I was like, I said, no, she's like, what are you looking up? I'm like, well, I don't want to look like an idiot. I mean, I don't know what the <laughs> cultural differences are. And I'm like, and then I'm looking at like pictures. I'm like, it looks like he lives in Ontario. It <laughs> looks like Ontario to me. Um, there's a very similar feel. I was like, it was, it was a pleasant surprise. There's a maple syrup. Yep. yep. Right. Yeah. Yep. This is you guys have maple syrup. <laughs> Would you crazy. stop right now? Right now. Because <laughs> at that's... one point in time, before we were going to do this, I had tried to work out a list of questions. I was like, I'm going to ask Jeremy and Chris like questions like, who brings an alcohol back to your table at your game tonight? <laughs> What's the difference between New Hampshire and Ontario? What would somebody bring? Do you have your questions? I didn't bother writing them up. What would somebody bring as a drink to a game at your table? Jeremy, first. 
Tim Hortons alcoholic coffee. Non alcoholic. Tim Hortons coffee. Tim Hortons coffee. Alcoholic. If if you don't know what Tim Hortons is, it's a coffee donut shop in Canada that basically like I are, I live in a very very small town and there are three Tim Hortons <laughs> in it. it. It is like it is like a blue collar Starbucks. It is like we have three Tim Hortons in my town and, and one Starbucks. Uh, and you know everybody is. Up, up here in Canada, you call it Timmy's. You don't even call it Tim Hortons. You just call it Timmy's. And you don't even talk about coffee. That's like a double double probably. <laughs> yeah, double. Uh, no, this I only drink when I dropped the sugar long ago. So alcoholic beverage. Uh, most times it's beer. And of late, like there's so many micro. I don't know what it's like in the states, but there's so many micro in in, in Canada right now. Yeah. New Hampshire. What, somebody sits a bunch of guys get together at a table on a Saturday night to game. What are they drinking? Well, um, th- there's a bunch of commercials that that play that say that uh, you know New England, which is which is New Hampshire, Maine, you know Massachusetts. Yep. It's, it's a bunch of the, the Northeast up here. Um, uh, it says uh, New England runs on Duncan, and <laughs> so so people, people. I've actually heard that. Yeah, pe- people okay. people w- w- would bring like Duncan's coffee. You know, sometimes iced coffee. Like Greg, he loves iced coffee. He's always drinking iced coffee. Um, and other people, like uh, we live kind of in a suburb of a suburb of like the the major city, which is Manchester. And okay. and so people like will drive out to to mine and Kate's house to play. Um, I really miss that. Uh, and they would usually bring Dunkins with them. Uh, as far as alcohol goes, no one in the group really brings alcohol to the table. I, I don't think it's. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if people have a prejudice against it or whatever, because people do drink, but for some reason it doesn't really seem to come up um, at the table. I don't really know why in particular, but it's usually just like iced coffee. It's usually caffeine because people have worked and, and we play on Fridays and they're like, I have to I have to stay awake for this game. <laughs> it, being honest, uh, we alcoholic beverage beverages coming to the D&D table has only been something sort of in the last maybe 10 well since jason arrived at my gaming table but uh <laughs> but no no in the lot you know when we were younger I, I we never it was old even when we were old enough to drink people were still bringing like it was cans, soda. cans of soda yeah we call it pop no. jason calls it soda because he's a hipster so <laughs> he thinks he's cool because he no. calls it soda in canada but in no. canada we call it pop no. okay so here's my thing so somebody brings a snack to the table. There's there's food on the table. Somebody's brought a bag of something. What is it? What is it here in what Canada? And what is it in New Canada? Potato Canada? chips. Potato chips. Okay, here's the thing. And I already knew somebody was going to say this. What flavor? And you can't say plain. <laughs> well, I like salt and vinegar. But I think a Canadian flavor. I don't know that they have this in the States. Ketchup chips? Ketchup, ketchup chips? I've never heard of ketchup chips. <laughs> Do you have you, you have Lay's in the states? Right? Yes, we have Lay's. Yes. Okay, so in Canada there are <laughs> Lay's, Lay's ketchup. Oh. And if you want a, a a flavor of chip that will mark up your Dungeons and Dragons books quicker than anything else, <laughs> ketchup, red, red ketchup dye from red chips. <laughs> uh, our, our, our snacks are usually um, like like brownie bites, chocolate chip cookies, uh, Oreos, you know, sweets basically. We had a guy that started pushing veg, veggie trays, and, and good for him. It was Guy. You know who Guy is, Jason. Uh, Guy. Guy would show up with veggie or fruit trays. Lamont always brings something that's gummy and sour. Yes, <laughs> always a sour, always a sour uh, candy. Always, always. Here's the thing I wanted to ask as two dungeon masters, and this was something. Okay, so I have like a series of like three questions. If we get to ask two dungeon masters living in two different countries, mm-hmm. if you you bump into a new dungeon master, he's run Lost Minds of Fandalver. He's now standing in the bookstore looking at those twelve shiny, glossy, hardcover campaign books. Which one would you recommend? What, what's something you're like? I ran that, or I played in that, and you know what? I love that. I'll, I'll let Chris go first. Um. What I would probably do is I would say to that person, if if you want to run kind of like a very simple, you know, straightforward kind of cookie cutter D and D game, 
do the Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide. It's got the Forgotten Realms. It's got Waterdeep. It's got, you know, I Never Went There. It's got all those things you've heard about, um, you've seen in games and different kinds of publications and whatnot. If, if you've heard of that stuff and you kind of want to see what it's all about and just get the the, the good general D&D &D experience, go for that. Um, that That's what I would say. But, and then I'd probably start going through all the books and saying, you know, this is good if you want this, this is good if you want that. And I would say, what kind of flavor do you want to play? And then whatever they tell me, I'd point them to the book that had the proper flavor. <laughs> Jeremy, you got one? Okay. This has recently changed for me <laughs> because I would have, I would have sent them to, I would have immediately told them to pick up uh, what's the one I can see the image in my head. The one, the what's the bar in water deep that they did all the, the portal, the yawning portal. The yawning I would have put in the yawning portal for two reasons. The Sun of Citadel is a great little starter adventure. Uh, it's a little dungeon crawl heavy, but there's lots of places to branch out from that with their own game. Like they can do a sequel to it and things like that. Really easy. Forge of Fury, one of my favorite sort of early adventures. It's a third level adventure and it has a dragon in it, which makes it even better. It's a dungeon <laughs> and a dragon. And uh, you can see a pattern here with my thinking. And I think... I think that that. However, I'm going to tell you something. Curse of Strahd. So good. I had I had sort of I've run so much Ravenloft that when Fifth Edition came along, and Curse of Strahd came out. I just went, no, thank you. I did buy the book because I'm a completionist, but uh, <laughs> I can see behind him. I can see them. <laughs> a lot of stuff behind him. Yeah. I but I uh, but I didn't run it. And now I'm playing in Curse of Strahd. A friend of mine, she's DMing it, and it's amazing. Mm -hmm. They've yep. they've fleshed that out. It's really good. Yeah. And I think of all and and there's so much support out there for it. Like you can, there are people. Uh, if you go on to like Patreon, there's like an artist that has like done these amazing pictures of all the locations in Curse of Strahd. So you could just drop those pictures. Like if you're playing online you're, you're going to be able to put them right in front of your players. But if you're playing around a table, like it's just a matter of hiding them on a laptop and spinning it around. Uh, Curse of Strahd is, I think, a, I think it's, I think it's fifth edition's masterpiece to be entirely honest. Yeah. The, yeah. The, the more I've looked at it, you have to like dark. Gothic horror. Yeah. Gothic. It doesn't have to, you don't have to focus on the horror. True. You can make it lighter. True. But I just think as a, like as a one book, setting like barovia is only maybe three towns and a whole bunch of adventure locations right i think a dm could do so much with that and and i think there's so much support out there for that material that if you had finished lost minds of Fandelver, you could easily have that party wander into the mists of ravenloft and pick up in barovia okay now you're looking for your next question you're both dungeon masters opposite sides of an international border <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God, I'm so sick and tired of people playing this race, class, archetype. Is, does nobody play anything? But is there something you just seem to find every party or every adventure has one of these? Follow-up question. My God, I would love to sit down at a table where somebody is playing this. I'm going to let you take that, Jeremy. I'll be back in just a sec. Sure. Uh, chaotic neutral. This goes back to the alignment conversation. Warlock, Tifling. <laughs> this, it does seem like, I like an archetype. I'm I'm done with that. You're done with that, eh? I'm like, done with that. It's it's so stereotypical. Also, um, Tiflings that speak with a Russian accent. Thank you, Critical Role. Oh, I wasn't sure where you're going there, but now I see it. I don't watch mm -hmm. a lot of critical role. I I am over, so over that. Uh, I like I like critical role, but I'm just like. But Tiflings in general, it looks like so. Yeah, Tifling, a Tifling warlock in particular, though. Tifling warlock with chaotic neutral as their alignment. I mean, I'm ju I'm just done with that, and and the. Basically, the what's her name in Critical Role? Laura. Uh, you know, Laura an amazing, yeah. yeah, amazing role player. But I'm so tired of the Russian tifling 
warlock yeah that's <laughs> that's my that's why I would love a warlock. So what I would love to come to the table, I would like to take that exact thing that I hate and I would like to turn it on my on its head. So my idea is that you uh, you bring a a lawful, the opposite alignment, maybe lawful, neutral, lawful, good. Uh, you make it a, um, you still can, you can keep ty- tiefling, but instead of, uh, or tiefling, however you want to say it, instead of the Russian uh, you don't give him horns. You give him like little moose antlers and he's Bob and Doug McKenzie. I don't know if people are going to know that reference, <laughs> but he becomes like, good day, eh? Hey, 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 yeah. How you doing, eh? Like you just play up the Canada so hard on that typhling. <laughs> we talked I would about love, I would love to see I'm getting tired of like every dwarf being Scottish. I'm like, they should just be French Canadian. <laughs> I would love... <laughs> I would love this to have If you could have a dwarf calling someone a tabernacle... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, let's not get... Chris, is there, is there a particular character type you're like, oh my god, I, and I guess maybe it's just new players or it's hot on the scene, but I seem to see this character all the time. Uh, probably the one that I see most often is... Um, goliath barbarian it it seems to be a combination that people always gravitate to and i don't hate it it just it just seems to be very common that people will do if they're going to play a barbarian they usually play goliath i don't i don't see any other kind of a race paired with with barbarian um which is which is fine whatever (laughs) younger guys because i played a couple of online campaigns and there's like a couple younger guys and barbarians and monks, young guys want to punch stuff. I don't know what it is. <laughs> they just need to be beefy, and they just want to—they just want to be able to like bust down doors. Yeah, yeah. Um, as far as your second question goes, I, I would want to see something unusual, like maybe, um, you know, a warforged wizard or something like you know something that you just wouldn't really put together. You know, something where where you know the, the racial ability bonuses don't really match up with the class but you're doing it strictly for the flavor. You know, I, I, th- I think something like, like a Warforged wizard would be really fun. Can I amend my answer? Nonsense. You're not worrying about the numbers. <laughs> you want to amend I, your answer? <laughs> can I make the first amendment to my answer? Uh, the first yeah. amendment to my answer is I would actually love to see the stereotypical dwarf fighter, the stereotypical halfling rogue. I don't see him anymore. That's like, true. Now everything is like, everything is like an Iraq or a monk or or Eric Hokra, sorry, Eric Hokra Monk, or, um, you know, a tabaxi rogue, or like, I'm just like, what happened to vanilla? <laughs> uh, me, and I guess people are done with it, but just being the old fart that I am, uh, th- yeah, I would like to see people go back to those. I understand. Okay. Games that are not Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition in and around your community. What's hot? What's moving? What have you noticed is like, I, I suddenly seeing people playing this other game. Uh, or is it just predominantly fifth edition? Is it literally got that hold? Well, are you talking like tabletop role playing games or tabletop games b- more broad? You know what? I think we expanded to tabletop games. I one of the things I like to do at Old Men Rolling Dice is I'll often post stuff that isn't a role playing game because mm-hmm. I really think that if you're really passionate about gaming, it isn't limited to just role playing. I think gamers. Right are very open-minded people and they're very willing to try almost anything. So. Yeah. I mean, I mean, we, we pretty much the only um, tabletop RPG we play is, is D and D. Um, I mean, I've, I've encouraged my players. I would, I would love to do one shots where my, where the other players from Mets of Roleplay will do something like, I don't care if it's my little pony, but I, I would like to have each one of them, like pick something that they like and do an adventure. I think that'd be a lot of fun. Um, what we play most often outside of D and D is we play magic. Magic the Gathering. That, that's pretty much what we play if we're not playing D and D. And when the world wasn't in a pandemic, we would get together for game nights and we would play things like um, Betrayal at House on the Hill. Um, we would play um, I have the Scooby Doo version. I got the Scooby Doo version, <laughs> and I have not been able to play it yet. <laughs> like I have not been able to play it. Yeah, I, I have the um, Betrayal at Baldur's Gate. Oh, okay, cool. Yes. Which yes. is fun. It's the D and D version. So we've definitely have played that. Um, so, so pretty much, you know, those are the kind of things that we play outside of D and D. And that's a great thing is it is beyond the pandemic, which I think I need to, I don't even know why I need to state that anymore. It is a great <laughs> time to be a gamer. There is a lot of great stuff on the market. 
Mm-hmm. Like, and it's not just stuff, it's quality stuff. Like there is fantastic products out there everywhere you look. The more you look, the more you find. You're like, I could literally end up with a room that looks like DM Jeremy's where I have shelves <laughs> and shelves of games. <laughs> it is so easy to do. Jeremy, what else are you playing? Or are you seeing being played that isn't D&D 5th edition? It's the best of times and the worst of times, right? So, like, there's tons of people playing D&D. Unfortunately, they will only play D&D 5th edition. I have tried other role-playing games. Uh, you and I have played a little bit of Call of Cthulhu. But I like Call of Cthulhu. I've heard I that's good. I've heard it's oh, good. Call of Cthulhu is so good. Um I bought the Alien role-playing game because I'm a big fan of Alien. Uh, I would. Uh, Alien is awesome. I I just I I don't. No one is ever playing anything else other than D and D. There's so much good role-playing game. So many good role-playing games out there. I cannot get a group to try it. They will not leave their comfort zone. They're like, nope. D and D five E scratches all my itches. I'm not. I'm not moving from this. Uh, this place i used to play a lot of other different games like, like i used to play you know vampire the masquerade and werewolf the ascension i used to play ars magica i used to play gurps you know we, we had all kinds of other things that that we played yeah. back in the day but now it's just it's just fifth edition game. at one point i had a huge very long running game of werewolf the apocalypse going mm-hmm. it went on for i bet you a year and a half two years nice. um and uh and it was so much fun I'd love to play Vampire the Masquerade. I, I bought the newest edition uh, by, who's it by now? Morph, it's it's being published by Morphidius or something. Anyway. It's, not, it's not White Wolf anymore, it's something different. It, yeah, yeah, no, it's not, it's not White Wolf anymore. It's been passed <laughs> around. And, but, but the new edition is, is great. I've read through it and I, I really like it. Uh, okay. I, I want to play Numenera, but no one will... I can't get a group to play with me. Uh, <laughs> what else do I have back here? <laughs> you got a lot of stuff back there. <laughs> uh, I'd love to... Pl- I'd actually like to play the new Pathfinder, Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Mm-hmm. I'd like to give that a shot. Uh, but people are comfortable fifth edition is such so easy it it's is. so easy to pick up that it's hard it's then hard to introduce something that's a little more crunchy people are like why why all <laughs> this why can't we go back to, like it's so much easier on that side of the fence so yeah i think i think I, i'm not i'm not it's really not a complaint because it's it's never been easier to find a dnd game true okay is there a favorite local gaming store anybody wants to give a shout out to right now? In case this audio ends up getting used, there's a reality. It might get chopped. But do you, does everybody have a, a gaming store where you're like, this is my stop. This is where I go to for all my needs. Well, I know. I know yours. You, I want to hear, Chris, if there's a good store in New Hampshire that Chris goes to. Uh, yeah. I uh, Two of my friends from high school, um, they have a store that they opened up in, in in the city of Manchester that I mentioned, which is the that's awesome. The, the biggest city um, in New Hampshire, and which you know isn't still very big compared to New York or LA, but um, you know it's big for us. And uh, they uh, have dude, a, dude, we're in Canada. Well, we don't even know what big cities <laughs> are. Really. Toronto. By the way, if you if you want to be a real Canadian, you don't say Toronto. You say Toronto. 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 How, how how big is the city that you guys live in? Um, probably the, probably we're in a suburb. How many is it here, Jay? Uh, is it ten thousand? It's not. I don't think it's even ten thousand. And uh, hang on a sec. I'll find out right now how many people are in the biggest city to us is a place called Brantford. Okay, and it's not a big city. Uh, we are literally in the suburbs. I live in a very very Brantford. A hundred thousand people. Okay. okay, yeah, Manchester is a hundred and twenty thousand, twenty five thousand, maybe somewhere around there. Um, and, uh, and the store is called, uh, the store is called double midnight comics. And, uh, you know, they do all men ordering during the pandemic and stuff. They do curbside pickup, all that kind of thing. And, uh, my friends that I went to high school with run it. So it's always nice to go in there and say That's hi to awesome. them. Yeah. Do they have playing space in the store? Yes, they do. Yeah. Yeah. They, this is something that I've seen yeah. half. This was not something when I was a kid that was available, No, but no. now it, you like you wouldn't open a gaming store without some playing space. Yes, that's true. Yeah, they do magic and D anD D, and and I think Pokemon and some other things there. Maybe Hero Clicks and stuff. Do like they do that, any so. Warhammer? Um, you know, I don't. I don't think I've ever seen them advertise it. I'm not saying that people probably can't go in there and just use the space however they want. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't know that they run any kind of 
Warhammer events, but I could be wrong. You can let the boys at Double Midnight Comics know that they have another follow on Instagram. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Jason. <laughs> no, that's no problem. Uh, in, our, always- in, our, in our little town, we have the Devil's Bench. Devil's Bench. Yeah, there's two gaming stores in town, uh, and both are good. But I just made a connection with the Devil's Bench early on when they opened, and they're very, they're, it's like a little, it's not big. It's a very small store, but it does have some gaming space, mm-hmm. and mostly Wargaming is done there. Warhammer, Warhammer 40K, uh, which I play, but not not to the sort of levels of uh, of fandom that, erupt at the store uh and then wednesday nights we sort of take over the store for D and myself i dm there and there's a another do you only dm with your home group chris um lately yes but like i said i mean any any opportunity that i have to introduce another group like re, like yeah. the, the the twitch thing for for extra life mm-hmm. um occasionally i did stuff at a store in um uh, Concord, New Hampshire, which is about 20 minutes north of us. And um, that is uh, Collectibles Unlimited. Uh, and Mike is a friend of mine there. And I ran some like game day stuff for fourth edition. So so if I have an opportunity to do stuff, especially with new players, I will do it. But it's primarily just my home group. Actually, that was one of the points I think we made in the end of the things new players bring to the table. Jeremy made a speech. He's like, you, as a DM, if you ever get a chance to game at your local gaming store, mm-hmm. Meet new people, build the community, and he and he's like, and if I remember correctly, he's like, it makes you up your game because you want to be the best you can be. <laughs> you know your friends and family are going to give you leeway, right? But when you're gaming for somebody, you want to you want to show them the best that you can be. Mm-hmm. He's like, it's really good practice. And it's if, not just- if I have a bad week and I don't get prep time in, and my me and my buddies sit down on the weekend to play Dungeons and Dragons, and I'm not quite prepped as well as I should they're all going to have to suck it up and just take it because <laughs> I had a busy week. But if you're going into to the store to run a game, like you do, you up your game. And on top of that, you want, this is just me because I, I, I may be too prideful, but I want everyone walking off of that table going, Jeremy's the best DM I've ever been with. <laughs> like that, that was the best game of D&D I've ever had. We have to go home and tell Steve, our DM, he sucks because Jeremy works that. <laughs> like, that's the kind of reaction I'm aiming for when I DM for a group of people I've never DM for. And I'm not saying I get it all the time, mm-hmm. but in my mind, that's where I want to be, that they leave that table going, if we could have Jeremy DM for us every time. Yeah, it's amazing how your descriptions get so much uh, more in-depth and you have so much <laughs> exactly. more excitement like, in what you're doing. What's he wearing? Chain mail. What do you mean? What kind of chain mail? Like metal chain mail, dude. He's wearing chain mail. <laughs> and then at the store, it's like, what's he wearing? Oh, he's wearing chain mail and it's gritty. It's it's dirty. It's been out in the field for a while. And <laughs> right, he's right. obviously a veteran. Like, I don't <laughs> give that to you at home. For you guys. <laughs> yep. one, we're getting near the end of this, I'm sure. But one of the sure. last points I want to make is I've listened to some of your podcasts and it is fantastic. I like the sense of humor. It, it resonates with me. One of the things I've noticed the most, and this is about to become a very hot topic, is people who sing while they play. I play a game where somebody occasionally will sing. Mm-hmm. That somebody who will sing is currently on this podcast with us. <laughs> and I love him dearly, and he means the world to me, but he is not a great singer. Does Must Chris have be- singers? <laughs> you, have you not heard? There is a female that plays in your game sarah yeah it absolutely she, is she a, she must be a professional singer there's uh, no she, question about it she 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 has been a professional singer she was a big band singer she's very well trained yes when i hear her do her vicious mockery or some sort of yes yes doing your like holy crap this woman actually sings she's awesome yeah she's and very you're talented saying i can't <laughs> Uh, we can send him the clips if you would like, and he can compare them. Okay, there are, I'm, not, I'm not. I'm not saying there's not some times that I don't go. Uh, never mind. I'm not even getting into it. No, Sarah, I, Sarah is professionally trained. She is. There is something wrong with me that when people talk, I can take something they say and immediately click into a song. You can click it into a song. Yes. It, like someone <laughs> says respect, and I go Aretha Franklin on this. <laughs> and, I didn't say you couldn't click it. 
He's just saying you couldn't say it. Uh, that's what he's saying. <laughs> I'm really, I'm really hurt by that. I'm really hurt by that. <laughs> top notch click. You click things in beautifully. There's no question about your click. My point is, if you have not heard Sarah sing, you absolutely scan through some. It is. I was like, you're listening to podcasts, and you're like, oh, that's funny. Oh my god, that's good. Oh, I see what they're doing there. And then you're like, holy crap! Somebody just sang. Who? Who? Like has an ear. Like somebody sang. Yeah. Who knows how to sing? It, it was super awesome. Yeah. I just want to do a shout out to uh, Sarah. Yeah, and, Sarah. Yep, like, yep. And if people want to listen, if people want to listen to um, this is not about Sarah. This is about putting a boot in my ass. That's no, what this is about. <laughs> I like good singing. And I heard good singing, and oh. like. Who yeah, the, the the singing is in the Involos Wake series because w- when when my wife was pregnant and we knew the baby was coming, we 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 recorded Involos Wake. We did six parts, and I had each of the other people DM one of the parts. It was the first time that any of them had actually DM'd um, like a story driven kind yeah. of adventure. They had they had done battle royals. I wrote battle royals for them, and they ran the battle royals just as kind of like getting their feet wet. And then for Involos Wake, I had them run like a story type adventure. And um, they took the first four and I actually got to play in the first four. So I was so excited. I got to play um, as a player. And, uh, and then I ran part five and six. So um, I'm not quite sure where it is, but Sarah does play uh, a bard at some point. And she plays the bard, I think in the last two or three adventures, maybe parts four, five, and six, but somewhere in there, I think toward the second half and toward the end, she starts playing a bard and, you know, and she's an amazing singer. So it was really fun <laughs> to, well, to, to be a part of. It was a fantastic thing to hear. It's nice when you hear, because I mean, with a podcast, it really is an, an audio um, sort of medium. I mean, yeah. the, the voice means so much. And you guys do some, I think I heard a snake person at one point in time. Yes, yes. Really great role playing. I like, but then the singing hit me. And I was like, oops, sorry, it's the whole time. Um, <laughs> the singing hit me and I was like, wow. This person isn't just seeing like this person. <laughs> it was, and so I just wanted to make sure that got mentioned because it, it was something I, I really, I really found amazing. That that's great. I mean, we appreciate it. I mean, I know Sarah will will be tickled to think about it. So we really appreciate that. And I also enjoyed the stuff I listened from you guys. I, I had never heard of Hawk the Slayer. Actually, I'm sorry, I, I'd heard of Hawk the Slayer, the movie, but I had never watched it. And so now I have to go watch it now because I listened to that episode of you guys. <laughs> <laughs> it is horrible. I'm sure it is, but I got to go watch it. <laughs> and yet, there's there's something about it that just is. He was the right man for his time at the right place. So. <laughs> we have a cartoon episode coming up. We're doing '80s cartoons. Friday. Nice, nice. I will definitely. Yeah. definitely We're going to record it on Friday, and yeah, um, I had to dig deep for this one too. I'm super excited about it. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Okay, so. Old Men Rolling Dice. Um, check them out on Twitch and also um, wherever you get your podcasts. And we are Nights of Roleplay. And guys, I mean, this was great. I, I love meeting you guys. We're definitely kindred spirits. It's great to talk to people in Canada. This is a very unique experience. A lot of fun. It's been snowing here all day, just so you know. Like it's been just snowing constantly. What, what's yeah, the weather been like for you guys today? Snow, snow, snow. Not as much. Today it warmed up. It got above, it got above freezing. <laughs> and we had a little bit of melt happening. A little bit <laughs> gotcha. of melt. Like the roads, the roads got plowed this morning and then the temperature rose just enough that you can see asphalt again. <laughs> but awesome. you know what? Uh, we, we've had a pretty light winter. Okay. Like it's been Up until like the last sort of week and a half. Yeah. Like we had no snow in December. <laughs> none. Wow. None. Nothing through, <laughs> not a whole lot through January. And then right here at the end of February, we've been dumped on. Yeah, we, we are yeah. not, we are not in the Canadian. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There, there are Canadians out there right now, like in Alberta and Saskatchewan, cursing us. But, like they know what <laughs> snow is. Cursing they know what snow is. <laughs> uh, we have my <laughs> wife's one of my wife's bridesmaids. Neither one of them want to talk to me right now. Where are they? North Bay and Ottawa. Oh, Tanya's bridesmaid is in uh, Yellowknife, Northwest, uh, Northwest Territories. That's a lifestyle choice. <laughs> <laughs> like they've been, they've had snow since. Yeah, June. Yeah, no, no kidding. No, no, like September, probably September. <laughs> yeah, the sun doesn't even go down. Like they have, they have seasons where the sun doesn't go down, and then they have seasons where the sun doesn't come up. So <laughs> that that's that is not. If you want to, con- Jason and I are like a half an hour from Buffalo. Oh, yeah. Right. Right. Yep. Yep. So <laughs> yeah. 
Awesome, guys. Yeah, well, we're just going to give a quick shout out tonight to role play as well. Uh, we, we've obviously enjoyed uh, this immensely. I can see from the smile on Jason's face. Uh, I think he was holding on to that singing thing right till the end. And, uh, and, and you know what? You talk a good game. You talk a good game, Jay. You're like, you're like, I like it when people bring funny voices. I like when people just throw it all out there on the table. I threw it all out there on the table for you. And then you're like, you stink, dude. <laughs> You stink, dude. So, just, <laughs> you literally rojamboed me. You rojamboed me. <laughs> so, so tonight's a role play. I, I think we should probably do this again. Sounds good. We Sounds should probably good. do this again. I, I would love to do that. And maybe if the opportunity ever presents itself, maybe we could do like a mixer where we get half an old men rolling dice crew and half a night's a roll. We could do a one shot maybe. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be great. I would love to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds great that you know we'll see we'll see we'll awesome. like cross this border again with role playing yeah sounds great sounds great guys well thanks for having us all right thank you for having me as well it was great to do the cross promotion you guys you guys are awesome and we always sign off with good night dick Got i you. can't help it <laughs> Say Say does, it, does, does that mean something no it doesn't it, i don't know why <laughs> the first time we ever did a podcast i think i was nervous i didn't know how to end it and i think i said good night dick was okay. there an old talk show that ended on Good Night, Dick? I don't know. I think it's just a level of potty humor you have. I really, I really feel like <laughs> you're your inner, inner 13 year old. Oh, okay, our last, Jason, our, our, go, our, last go, go, go our last interview had four girls on it. We didn't know how to end it, did we? No, <laughs> how do you say Good Night, Dick? After we talked about women role playing, I'm going to shut up now. I have diarrhea of the mouth. I'm done. Okay. Good night, Dick. <laughs> <laughs> If you enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a review anywhere this podcast can be found. Our social media links, plus additional content, can be found on our website at knightsofroleplay.com. Please tell your friends about Knights of Roleplay, an adventuring podcast, and spread the word through social media. Your help and support are greatly appreciated. <laughs>